Okay, welcome to the first MOOC of the Charles Darwin Evolution, uh, first webinar of the Charles Darwin Evolution in Tropical Australia MOOC. My name is uh, Keith Christian. I'm a zoologist here at Charles Darwin University, and I'd like to welcome a very special guest, Professor Janet Brown. Professor Brown is the Aramont Professor of History of Science at Harvard University, and she's also the author of uh, an award-winning two-volume biography of Charles Darwin, as well as other scholarly works about Charles Darwin. Most recently, she's been uh, <clears throat> uh, appointed as the Darwin Scholar here at Charles Darwin University. So welcome, Janet. Thank you, Keith. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. So how, how has it been being a uh, Darwin Scholar? It's been lots of fun. Having spent a great deal of time working on Charles Darwin, I'm very much enjoying being in the city of Darwin because everything is called Darwin this and Darwin that. It's am amazing and delightful for me. Right. So you've uh, been visiting us here for about a month, is that right? Yes, right. I've been here for a month. I'm going down to Alice Springs at the end of this week and then we'll be back again for another week or so. Okay. Great. Yep. So uh, Professor Brown will be here uh, not only for today's webinar, but also next week's webinar. Okay, just oh, very quickly going to go through a few uh, sort of housekeeping slides and introductory slides before we get into the more interesting stuff. Just as a, as a reminder, hopefully all of you have had a chance to, to start the, the, the working your way through the materials, but uh, just as a reminder, part one to, uh, this week, we're talking about the life and times of Charles Darwin. Next week, the uh, evolution of the theory of evolution, or the evolution of that idea. And the third week we'll deal with Wallace and biogeography, bringing it into this region. And then finally we'll bring it right into tropical northern Australia and look at examples of evolution in the animals and plants here in tropical Australia. In this webinar we'll be uh, discussing some points of interest related to the material in the first week, uh, first part of the, of the MOOC. And uh, we'll also provide you the opportunities to participate by uh, chatting uh, and uh, responding to polling questions. So just, uh, if you want to, um, <clears throat> please feel free to ask questions or participate in any way, make comments using the chat panel. Uh, so you pull that, uh, pull that down and just type in, in a little square and uh, we'll be able to see it. When we come to the polling questions, uh, uh, just go to the polling response menu and then select your answer A, B, or C and uh, we'll tally those up and talk about the, the, the results. So please uh, don't hesitate to, to respond, to participate in this. There's, for most cases, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just sort of your, your opinion or your ideas. So. Okay, in, in part one, we've covered topics of uh, the life of Charles Darwin, first of all. You can really divide the, the life of Charles Darwin into, into three parts, or at least I think you can. Well, let's see if Janet agrees. But his early life, uh, into, including his university days, and then the voyage of the Beagle, and then the rest of his life uh, when he's, that he's, he spent in England after the voyage, uh, when he did most of his, um, his publications and other work. Uh, also in part one, we're looking at some of the readings and some information about the, the, the voyage of the Beagle, including the, the uh, voyages of the Beagle, including the, the naming of, of Port Darwin. And then uh, next week, we'll look at the evolution of evolution, where we talk more about the voyage of the Beagle, and in particular as, as related to his uh, development of his ideas. So just to get you started with this polling activity, I'll ask you to respond to this question. Which period of Darwin's life do you find the most interesting or the most appealing, I guess? His early life during the voyage of the Beagle or after the voyage? So I guess another way to think about this is, you know, would you prefer the adventurous life on the voyage of the Beagle or a more uh, com comfortable life in the countryside of England? So if you can pull down that, use the poll button, make your selection, 
uh, A, B, U, C, and then we'll just tally those up and just see how which which lifestyle appeals to most people. Actually, we can probably come back to that. But but while while that okay, got that okay. So uh, I'll just go back to the questions. So, oops. Here we go. So, is early life a appeal to a lot of people? <laughs> not so many the voyage. Okay, that's interesting. All right. Well, that's uh, very interesting. Not many people are that ad adventurous to go on a voyage, particularly uh, 150 odd years ago, or more than that, almost. Now, Janet, can you show, tell us uh, what we're looking at here? This picture is of a Cambridge College in England. It's Christ's College, Cambridge, which is where Darwin was a student. He had been previously at Edinburgh University, but that was unsuccessful. Uh, he was a medical student at Edinburgh, as you know, and his father then sent him to Cambridge in order to take an ordinary degree, what they called an ordinary degree. This is a picture of the, um, they call them, um, courtyards and Darwin's room is one of the upstairs windows on the left. Okay. So how would you characterize, um, so he didn't make it in medicine, when he came to Cambridge how would you characterize him as, as a student? As a student? Darwin's very honest about his time as a student. He said he hardly worked at all and that he did go to a few lectures but they were not any kind of lecture that um, grabbed his attention. He particularly, of all the lectures, he enjoyed the botany ones and the geology ones. So he's obviously showing a lot of interest in natural history at that point. Most of his time he spent having fun. He talks about how he had a horse at university and he went out riding and hunting. He went out collecting natural history specimens. He had a big collection in his rooms, his dorm, uh, in this picture. And also, the, he played cards and he drank wine, he, he records. Okay. There is a, a related picture looking out from his room. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So this is, this is the view he would have had. Yes, this is a modern picture, obviously, um, taken a little while back when Darwin's rooms were um, open to the public for people to see what it must have been like. So in Darwin's day, Back in the 19th century, he wouldn't have had those flowers outside his window. That's for the sightseers. But you see how attractive it is? And looking out through that window, you can almost imagine that you're looking into the future, that you're like Darwin, you're looking at the life ahead of you. So those are a, just a little bit of information about his life before the voyage, and, and that, that appealed to, quite a, to, to most people. The second part didn't appeal to as many people, and probably because um, <laughs> conditions, are, you probably have a pretty good idea of the conditions on board the Beagle. Can you mm. tell so, us a bit about that? Yeah, you remember this boat, the Beagle, the ship was very small, and it was a three, three-masted sailing ship um, from 150, maybe more, years ago. The quarters were very tight. In this image, you can see it's a cross-section. Darwin's cabin was at the on the left hand side under the poop deck it was not just Darwin's cabin it, he was sharing it with two other people it was the cabin in which they drew the charts it was a surveying voyage and the job of the surveyors was to redraw the charts of the coastlines which were all stored in those big drawers underneath the chart table very cramped quarters they didn't have beds, they didn't have bunks, they had to sling up their hammocks every night over the chart table. Yeah. So apart from being um, cramped, uh, Darwin also suffered from seasickness, is, is that right? Yes, uh, Darwin was very seasick. He says in every single letter home how seasick he's been feeling and eventually he said he was sick of the sea. That's probably why he was keen to travel on land when the ship came into port or to survey particular areas the captain who knew he was 
who knew Darwin was seasick, would let him off, off onto the land with um, a guide or one of the sailors, and he could spend time exploring on land. So the voyage is almost one on land as well as on sea. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, this. Hopefully, you can see the red line that um, that shows the, the the route that Darwin took, or that the Beagle took. So starting in England and then coming down to the east coast of South America, and these, as you can see, the fair hops, and so he got off at, at most or all of these stops and spent, his, yeah. spent quite a bit of time. Yes, South America was the main point of the survey. That was the, the Brits wanted to survey the southern tip of South America for all kinds of commercial and political reasons, and Darwin was allowed off the boat uh, uh, at different times, perhaps three weeks or a month or maybe even a little longer for expeditions inland. He made five big inland expeditions during the uh, quite long period that they were surveying around there. So then they went around the, the, the Cape and up the, up the west coast of South America where he did, I think, a lot of geology work as well as other kinds of exploring. And then off to the Galapagos Islands, which we'll talk about more probably next week. Um, but it was obviously an important part of the voyage across the Pacific and then down to southern Australia, where they made a few stops in Australia, not including this where the city of Darwin is. And we'll talk a bit more about how that came to be later. And then around, around uh, Cape of Good Hope, and, but then rather than going straight back up to England, they went back to South America. So what, what was that all about? Yes, the, they did go back to South America. It was disappointing for most of the sailors and other people on the ship that they would have rather gone straight back to the United Kingdom. But the captain, who was in charge of the survey, felt that it was vital to go back to the place where they had begun the measurements uh, formally, so that he could tally up that everything was exactly accurate, having been around the world from that particular starting point in South America. Okay. So then they eventually made their way back to England, and they were gone, what, four and a half years or so? Yes, or it was very nearly five years by five the years. time they got back. Yep. Okay. And then when they got back, we spent a, he spent some time, I think, in London, but they eventually not in a few years he ended up here at Down House mm. and really his traveling days were, all, were more or less over at that stage, is, is that right? I mean, in, in terms of big traveling in, anyway. Yes, yeah. Dar Darwin didn't travel at all much after that. He of course went on holiday. He, at this time when he moved into this house in the country, he had um, a wife and already two children, but there was more children to come and he never really wanted to travel again. No more expeditions. If we were thinking about it philosophically, perhaps he'd got it out of his system. Yeah. Okay. This. Okay, so if you think about these three periods of Darwin's life, which of these three parts of his life do you think was most influential in the development of his theory that, um, of, of evolution by natural selection? His early life, which is obviously, obviously the foundation of his education, the voyage of the Beagle, or the time after the voyage where he thought about it all and uh, eventually uh, wrote enormous amounts, really. So if you can go to the polling buttons, like your selection A, B, or C, we'll see how... Uh, what everybody thinks about that. Okay. So obviously, um, we could have a, a D, all of the above, uh, and you couldn't have one without the other, really. We, uh, it's not likely we, without the void you would have had. Uh, the other bits. So, okay, so it's fairly evenly e evenly divided. Uh, most, okay, B, oh no, so it's not even, mostly B. That's right, mostly B, um, the voyage. And mm. that is, of course, uh, 
that Darwin would agree. Yes, that's exactly what Darwin thought. So well done, those of you who suggested the voyage of the Beagle. Because if you look at this quote that we've got here, the voyage of the Beagle has been by far the most important event in my life and has determined my whole career. I think historians and other scholars are all agreed that Darwin's speaking accurately and truly here. He's very honest and he's right. So this is a, another view of, of Downhouse, the in, inside of the Downhouse, and it shows a few of his, of his um, items, some of which I think he uh, actually took on the voyage with him, and it shows a, the principles of geology, a book by Lyle, dissecting instruments, pocket microscope, and a telescope. So, uh, Janet, would you care to talk a bit, a bit about these? This was sort of the technology of the day, and how important was it to to Darwin and then maybe reflect on the technology that we use in evolutionary biology today compared to these right. instruments. So what you see here is a very interesting lineup of the different ways that individuals got their information. So there's an open book which is Lyle's, Charles Lyle's Principles of Geology. This book was on the Beagle. It was one of several books that the ship had a library, obviously not quite like we think of a library, but they had quite a few volumes, all mostly stored in the captain's cabin. And Darwin used this book to teach himself geology as he went around the world. So that's one way of getting information. There's, uh, just in front of that open volume, there's a little pocket microscope, which is that cylindrical thing with a brass top to it, which Darwin would probably have taken with him in his pocket or in his knapsack on any of the excursions and if something was too small to see obviously he would examine it. So that's observation that you get information by observing the natural world. We still do that. We don't have these little pocket microscopes anymore. What we have are the folding lenses now. There's a specimen of coral in between the two stacks of books so that's another example of how you get information about the natural world. You collect specimens, you take them away with you, you um, name them, you examine them. Sometimes they're alive, sometimes they're dead, sometimes they go to a museum. But they are, the, they are nature, and, and that's a really important part of how people understood things. And in front of the books that are on the right-hand side, is Darwin's telescope. And we know this is Darwin's. This is an illustration from, uh, this picture is from the museum in Darwin's house in England. It's a telescope. So that's another way of observing the world. Isn't that different from what we would be doing today? Hmm. If we were naturalists today, such as Keith going out on an expedition, you wouldn't really take your books with you. Uh, you would take a knapsack to put your specimens in, but you'd have all your little bottles and you'd have your formalin and you'd have a notebook to record things. It's very different. Yeah. And much of the work of field work now takes place back in the lab. I think we need to remember how much work now goes on in the lab with yeah. the very high-tech instrumentation. Yeah. So evolutionary biologists today often use instruments like PCR machine, machines, gene sequencers, uh, and uh, all sorts of other technology looking at the ge genetics. And of course it's interesting to, to remember that, that, that the field of evolutionary biology is older than the field of genetics. Yes. I mean that's, that's, that's sort of almost surprising. It, it wouldn't necessarily have happened to, have to have happened that way. I mean, when you think of Mendel's experiments, they were fairly basic sort of experiments, breeding peas and counting the colors of the, of the um, flowers and so forth and just keeping accurate records. So it, that's so actually something that Darwin could have done. I mean, could might have stumbled on that. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of other things. But so it, it could have happened the other way, but it's sort of amazing to me to think that Darwin came up with his ideas of evolution with no knowledge of genetics at all. It's completely remarkable. Yeah. He did experiment on 
uh, he did breeding experiments for quite some years on pigeons and primroses and other kinds of organisms in his in his own garden and as we've just heard he could have stumbled on Mendel's principles but he didn't and although he had quite a strong understanding of the passing down of traits uh, through the generations and quite a good understanding of the variation in each generation he didn't have genetics he didn't have what we have mm. and it's just astounding what he managed to do without that yeah yeah Okay, so this is a picture also at Down House, is that right? This is a wonderful picture of part of Darwin's garden at Down House. He, uh, as you know, was rather a prosperous gentleman and had a very large garden and a bit of farmland attached to it. This is a walking a path that he used to call his walking and thinking path. It's um, usually referred to as the sand walk because the substrate is a rather sandy gravel, keep it dry. And this, it's a cir circuit, and Darwin would walk this several times a day, wh whatever the weather, and used to think on it. It was his thinking path. So that's one other way that we're keen for you to understand how creativity works. We have the instruments, um, and the other ways of collecting nature and thinking about nature. But here we've got the other aspect of making science is you have to think. So the voyage was in the 1830s. So what was happening, what was he doing here at Down House in the 1840s and 1850s? After Darwin moved to this house in southern England, his life was very routine. He liked to keep his life running like clockwork. He had no need to have a job. He was wealthy enough not to have a job. So his life was dedicated to exploring the um, ramifications of the ideas of evolution by natural selection. And he was also very busy publishing the results of his voyage. Uh, conducting a very large correspondence with other people, finding out information that he needed for his books or for his developing theories. And as well as thinking and making those kinds of um, written works, he began to do little experiments in his um, farmyard so that he began to collect and breed pigeons, domestic pigeons, in order to see how the, the colours changed as you went through the different generations and if you interbred them. There were many experiments on plants so that he was actively exploring all the different aspects of the idea of evolution. Yeah. And one of those sort of side projects that he got off on was, was barnacles. Did, did he, didn't he sort of set out to sort of very intentionally to to study a particular group to get a very yes. good feeling of variation and what it is yes. to be, what it, what constitutes a species. Yes. Darwin writes about his barnacle work with a great deal of um, a, a good sense of humour. He had begun to, he had thought that he would just uh, identify and write an article about one particular barnacle. He had collected it on the Beagle voyage. It was a rather unusual aberrant kind of barnacle and he knew enough to know that it was unusual and once he'd begun to look at that he wanted to know what a normal barnacle was like mm. and then he kind of got more and more engrossed in the subject and asked to see other barnacles that other people had he went up to museums he began to think really he should do the whole um, order of, it's not an order, it's a class, isn't it? A family of barnacles, which he did do. He spent eight years working on barnacles, and afterwards he said to his friend Joseph Hooker, Well, it's just because you said to me nobody could, nobody ought to theorize about species until they thoroughly know a species. Right. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. We sort of think about, well, can I commit four weeks to a to this MOOC or not? I mean, he's going to commit eight years to barnacles, you know, so sort of a different, mm. different point of view. Okay, so he was very busy 
in those years writing about all sorts of things, plants, he did zoology, botany, geology, um, animal behavior, breeding studies, even plant behavior, yes. the movement of plants. And they had this tremendous background, uh, wealth of knowledge. And when I think about the way I approach when I'm going to write a paper, I go to my computer where I've stored my, the data from the experiments or the observations. I use the computer to analyze it. Then I use the computer or, or an iPad to read the papers, the background papers, and then I go on the internet and see if there's been any recent papers. And then finally I settle down to a word processor and start writing. And of course, Darwin had none of that. How, how did he manage to collate and organize all this sort of material? It was very different in the 19th century. Science was an exercise. It was something that you did on paper. So everything Darwin did in the science way, actually quite a lot of his ordinary life as well, was written down. And actually, that's tremendous for historians because it still exists. It's all written down. It's not hidden away in a computer somewhere. And he developed a personal filing system to keep that information in the place where he could then find it. So most of the beginnings of his writing down of results would be in a notebook or something else like that, perhaps at the bottom of some letter. He tended to tear pages out, uh, not of books, but out of notebooks, and he would put them on those old spikes. Do you remember how there were letter spikes? Right. Yeah. One spike for each subject. Or that he, eventually when he had too many subjects to do that, he would have big brown envelopes and all these slips of paper would be put in the envelope that was written, it was called embryology, or yeah. the envelope that was called barnacles, yeah. or whatever. And we still have those. So if a scholar wanted to go back and see how Darwin filed things, it would be tricky, but they could do that. Right, yeah. But he must have, I mean... It, even then, you have, so have to remember where, <laughs> if he has a stack of yes. uh, barnacle which papers, which? Yeah, which we're just, we're just, he must have had a tremendous, <laughs> well, it's obviously a tremendous intellect, but he must have had a good memory as well. Mm. Like you would, but you think. Um, uh, I, in Darwin's autobiography, he says that he, he never was very confident that he would remember things, which was why mm. he wrote it all down. Oh, okay. And then he said he didn't have an excellent memory, but he would always have a vague feeling that he had seen that before. And after a bit, he would know where to go find okay. things. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. Okay, well, another thing that he was doing at Downhouse during all these years was being sick. Uh, he was, he was after, after he returned from the, the voyage, he, he was um, sick for many years, well, for the rest of his life. And uh, there's a list of symptoms there. Um, there have been lots of ideas about that. Can, mm. what, can you tell us a bit about what is it? Do, do we know even today what, what he had or what his problem was? No, we don't know what he had. And I think it would be very difficult to go back and diagnose what Darwin had without having him in front of you. Like a modern doctor wouldn't diagnose you over the iPad or something, you would want to be there and have a few tests and um, be physically present. So it's likely we'll never know, but that doesn't stop people making suggestions. So there's a tremendous number of suggestions. The most common one is that Darwin somehow either caught something on the voyage or never quite recovered from the perennial seasickness on the voyage. But I think historians are also very, um, we're keen to incorporate the stress that Darwin must have had in having, uh, inventing a theory that was difficult, it was going to be very unconventional, he knew it was going to cause trouble, and perhaps some of his symptoms are a response to this stressful theory, uh, even before he'd published it. There's a beetle, a picture of a beetle on your screen, which is the Chagas beetle. And it's been said uh, sometimes very positively that he, he was bitten by one of these beetles. 
It carries um, Chagas disease, which is a bit like um, sleeping sickness. If, uh, it's common in South America. Um, but how are we ever going to know? Hmm. Yeah, so we can all have our opinions, and that's what Activity 3 is, is just to use the poll buttons to, you know, just think what the most likely explanation is, whether it's that Chagas d disease, or possibly more psychological than than uh, physiological, stress-related, or uh, he really did like to be left alone. Mm -hmm. He really enjoyed just staying at home in his later years. Uh, so go ahead and, and vote on those. But obviously, while you, everyone's doing that, these are not independent of each other. They could, they yes. could have been all of the yes. above. It could have been all of these, remember. Do you, could you comment a bit about the stress related to his controversial ideas? Was he really personally distressed by that idea, or there are times early in his the first few years after he returned from the Beagle voyage when these ideas were crashing around in his mind, very exciting ideas that he did appear to feel stressed out by them. In his notebooks, he writes things like, oh, you materialist. So he knew what he was up to okay. and found that difficult. I think by the time he was writing The Origin of Species, it probably wasn't quite so hard on him because by then he was used to it. It was yeah. his idea and he'd been working on it for 10 or 15 or even 20 years before yeah. he published. Okay. Yeah, well, it looks like a lot of people think that stress you think was, stress. Stress was yes. related. So that's certainly a possibility, but... Not Chagas. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's interesting. Okay. <clears throat> As we were just saying, Darwin was really a, a, very, a generalist. I mean, he knew something about everything in, in, in the natural world. Um, so this question is, in your opinion, what was the type of evidence that was the most important in developing his evolutionary theory? He was a zoologist, and there were, the, the, of course, the uh, Darwin's finches that we'll talk a bit, a bit more about next week. He was also a botanist and uh, wrote books about plants, and, and he was a geologist and wrote, wrote about coral atolls and other geological aspects. But if you had to pick, so we're not giving you the choice of D, all of the above, so you have to pick one of these. Um, one of these is possibly the most important. And so while everyone else is uh, choosing theirs, I would be interested in your, if you, your view, Janet. What do you think of those three? If you had to choose. If I had to choose. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a... I think it's an impossible question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if I was had my finger on the button, I would go for geology, right. which is interesting that uh, that is uh, the category that the fewest of you have pushed, that during the Beagle voyage, Darwin taught himself how to think by trying to understand the geological structures he was seeing. Mm. And of course he was interested in zoology. He loved zoology, um, insects, and all the other sorts of things, and was very interested in plants as well. Yeah. So it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah. Well, this next slide relates to the, to the geology. So this is a, a, a satellite photo of South America, um, with the white being the Andes, the snow on the Andes. And of course, uh, I think, as, as you said, geology was very important and he visited the Andes. He went up into the Andes, mm. Andes and found marine fossils at very high elevations, with, and, and then, which made it very obvious that it had been uplifted yeah. from the sea. And I think, I guess, that one of the ideas that, that was around at the time that a lot of people believed that the world was, say, 6,000 years old or just thousands of years old. And I think he, it was pretty obvious that um, the, the world is older than that yes. from, from looking at geology. Yes, and if we think about it in through Darwin's eyes, he would have said that much of the South American continent was relatively new yeah. 
geologically, that it had risen up out of the oceans within rather recent geological times because those shells that he found up on top of the Andes were relatively modern. And how exciting could that be that these enormous mountains, which he had just climbed up so he knew they were enormous, those vast plains that he had um, walked over and ridden over, all of this was relatively new. And that was something that Lyle had been saying in Lyle's book, but it's also something that Darwin kind of physically encountered the um, extent of the geology of South America and was extremely interested in then it, it's kind of unsettled the boundaries for him. It made him think differently about the, the, the world. He actually experienced quite a severe earthquake while he was on land. Yes, Andes. those mountains are still um, moving about. He experienced an earthquake that was quite a substantial one and also saw a volcano erupt oh, okay. about a month before the earthquake. And quite naturally, he put the two together and yeah. came up with a theory that the volcanoes are a kind of uh, release of pressure from underneath yeah. as, as the continent is moving about. Okay, I'll just pause here for a minute. There was one, an early question about how many people were on the Beagle. Do you have any idea how many, the total complement of the crew? Yes, about 90 people. I don't have an exact number. Several of those 90 were private individuals. So the captain had personally paid the salary of someone to look after the scientific instruments. Uh, so he was called a supernumerary. And the captain had also employed an artist to go with them, because the Admiralty wouldn't, you know, cheapskates, the government wouldn't pay for an artist. So that he was a supernumerary. Darwin was a guest, and Darwin's father was paying for him to go around. Mm. So there were five or six people who were not on the Admiralty uh, pay list. Yeah, so there's a question here about geological observations mm -hmm. and how that fit into the whole idea of evolution by natural mm -hmm. selection. And I, uh, like, like I said, I mean, there's, there's several ways, but I mean, there's several aspects to that. First of all, as you said, he saw that geology was very dynamic, earthquakes, volcanoes, all this was, was happening. But at the same time, there was other evidence to show that, that those things have been happening for a very long time. And so I think the, the fact that you know, when you start thinking of the world as being millions of years old rather than thousands of years old, and there's all sorts of possibilities for change. Mm -hmm. It's a, a very big part of the triumph of evolutionary theory is that it depends on the Earth being immensely old. Mm -hmm. If you're going to imagine lots and lots of gradual changes in animals and plants and human beings um, accumulating, then you need lots of time for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Darwin was discovering for himself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the other people that were around uh, at the time of Darwin. There are f uh, four people shown here from left to right. There's uh, Hinslow, which is uh, his botany professor at Cambridge, mm -hmm. who actually was instrumental in, in getting him on the voyage. Yes. Yeah. So he sort of nominated him for that yes. position. Shall I yeah. say something yeah, about Henslow? Sure. We've put Henslow in this little quiz exactly because it was Henslow who introduced Darwin to so many of so much of the natural history world when he was a Cambridge undergraduate. But it was and it was Henslow who passed on the invitation from the Admiralty for a young man to join the expedition on the Beagle. Henslow said to Darwin, You should go. So that's why he's there. That's why John Stevens Henslow is there. Yeah. Well, you go ahead and work Shall I go through? through? Yeah, sure. Joseph Hooker, as the second from the left, was probably Darwin's closest friend after he came back from the Beagle voyage. He was the principal botanist at the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew and was a friend and confidant 
for Darwin. He was a little bit younger than Darwin. He too had gone on a voyage of exploration seven or eight years after Darwin did. So they shared that sense of traveling. They, they knew what it was like being on a small ship and collecting information. The next one, Charles Lyell, you can see it has his signature underneath that black and white image. Charles Lyell, the geologist, was older than Darwin, but very influential as we've already discussed. It was Lyell's book that Darwin took with him on the Beagle Voyage, and which he used to learn about the geology of the different places he was seeing. And when Darwin came back, he became immensely fond of Lyle, they were very close colleagues. So that's influential. And here on the right, Thomas Henry Huxley, who only came to know Darwin towards the time when Darwin was writing on the origin of species. But it's Huxley who takes up the cause after Darwin published The Origin of Species. And it's Huxley who goes out talking and uh, writing reviews and um, fighting for Darwinism after The Origin of Species is published. So we've got the four of them there. Who do you think is the most influential? Okay. Hinslow and... Yeah. Hinslow and... Lyle. Lyle. Not Hooker. Not... Yeah. And, uh, no, not Hooker. Yeah. Huxley, Huxley's probably... Uh, not the best choice because he, as you said, he sort of came later and really didn't. He influenced Darwinism, but didn't influence mm. Darwin as much as as the other three or any of the other three, probably. Okay. Now, obviously, those those are that's a list of three people that were very influential in the time, but there were others that that that, that um, sort of added to this idea of and to, to Darwin's development of the idea of evolution by natural selection. And one of those was his grandfather. Could you say a bit yes. about that? Isn't that extraordinary yeah. to have a grandfather who has something of the same kind of idea? Yeah, it's amazing. Been lots of discussion about whether Darwin was influenced by his grandfather. The grandfather had been, um, had passed away long before Darwin himself was born, so he never knew his grandfather, but all the books his grandfather wrote a lot of books, were in their family library. And we know that Charles Darwin, uh, many uh, older people looked at Charles Darwin because he was the grandson of the famous Erasmus Darwin. Mm. So that Charles Darwin became famous himself, but obviously not all at once. And for many, many years he was known as Erasmus Darwin's grandson, which is kind of funny. Um, yeah. So Erasmus Darwin, yes, was very important. He had an evolutionary theory with uh, no mechanism in the way that Darwin's theory has a real solid scientifically based mechanism at its heart, which is natural selection. So Erasmus Darwin, the grandpa, thought about change and the interconnectedness of everything and he wrote poems and texts about how everything's interconnected and that organisms can change into one another but it was never accepted as a valid way forward for science. Right. Was it ever, did you ever have the other problem? Was he ever criticized like Darwin was later, in other words, by the people thinking that this is... Yes there, was some, yes, there were some okay. critics, but there was no, f for the grandfather, didn't encounter that pronounced religious controversy after the origin was yeah. okay. produced. All right. And, uh, was, okay, was the question was, was Darwin a colleague of John Gould or of his son Charles, the geologist? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we've been asked whether Darwin was a colleague of John Gould. So John, yes, the answer is yes. John Gould, the artist and ornithologist, and also he painted mammals as well. John Gould, who spent so much time in Australia, previously lived in London in the UK, and it was Gould who had um, 
classified, given names to all of Darwin's birds from the Beagle voyage. Not just the finches, but all the birds. Mm. And it was Gould who said to Darwin, whilst he was doing this, about those finches, he said, these finches aren't just varieties of one kind, they're all separate species. Do you know which island they came from? So it's Gould who's really instrumental in just triggering Darwin into that last moment. It's the last mm. key that he was looking for that made him think of evolution. This is before he had the idea of natural selection. So yes, he knew John Gould. And Charles the geologist, indeed, it's actually a grandson. Our Charles Darwin had a grandson called Charles Galton Darwin, and it's that Charles who's the geologist. Oh, okay, yeah. So did he, act, did he, as I recall, he didn't know the answer to that question. He didn't, he, he didn't actually record the, the places where the different finches came from, did he? No. I think we discussed this in the MOOC, right. that when Darwin was collecting finches, or all the birds that he could access on the Galapagos, he, it never crossed his mind that they might be different. They're mm. very close to each other, those mm. islands. Mm. You've been there, you know. And it didn't cross his mind to put a little tag on the legs about which island it was. Right. So all the Galapagos birds were put in one bag. And it was when he got home and Gould said, said to him, where did they come from? Yeah. This is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And Darwin had to backtrack. Hmm. So field geologists often do have to backtrack right. their yeah. information, but, yeah. but he could do it. Yeah, yeah. So there were others that sort of contributed to the idea. I guess one would have been Lamarck, who uh, came up with the idea of classifying and, and sort of getting at the idea of a species being this and you give it a name. And yes. so he was, in, I guess in some way, that sort of thinking would have influenced Darwin as well. Yes. So Lamarck, was very broadly a contemporary of grandfather Erasmus Darwin. So they were both 18th century figures and they thought about nature in a very 18th century way. Big changes between their time and Charles Darwin's time. And Lamarck usually gets a very bad press. I think he deserves a bit more attention now. He believed that there was lots of evolutionary change, that you could track it through the plant and animal kingdom and that the mechanism he proposed is one that we don't use today, which is that the environment had a direct effect on the organism, and the organism would change itself in response to the environment, and that that could be inherited. Yeah. So was it, do you know, was there correspondence between Erasmus and Lamarck, do you know? No, there wasn't correspondence between okay. the two of them. This was at the period when the French Revolution was gearing up, Right. Um, Lamarck died just before the French Revolution. Um, Erasmus Darwin lived through it, but there wasn't very much scientific contact between right. um, figures at that yeah. period. Yeah. And another, I think another person that Darwin sort of leaned on, uh, the ideas, was um, Malthus. Yes. The, the, he sort of took a mathematical approach and more or less said, well, you have two mice and then they have four and then you have 16 and you know you very quickly mathematically you come to the conclusion that will be neck, neck deep in mice and the reason or not is because most of them aren't surviving and just that idea that lots of things are being produced but most of them aren't reaching reproductive age. Yeah. The Malthus was read by Darwin and at the time of reading, again, it's one of these wonderful moments in history. We, we have a documentary record. Darwin wrote in his diary the date and that he was reading Malthus and that he was getting from Malthus exactly that notion that, that if everything was reproducing as much as it could and that there was no um, uh, pressures on, on populations, then we'd be overrun by everything. Hmm. There's something checking the numbers of all of us yeah. and every animal, every plant, otherwise be overrun. And it's that that Darwin gets from Malthus. And Darwin thinks, so what's making the ones survive? Hmm. What is it that's helping the ones survive? 
and it's Darwin's inspiration, it's not Malthus's, but Darwin adds to that the notion, well, it's the better ones, mm. the more adapted ones who survive. Yeah. Okay, uh, any others that come to mind? There's the yes. uh, uh, Harvard, not colleague, but Har another, another Harvard person. <laughs> yes. uh, because I come great. from Harvard, I want to put in the, <laughs> yeah. the names of the two Harvard professors who were also engaging in these kinds of thoughts. There's a botanist at Harvard, um, roughly the same age as Darwin, called Asa Gray, and he became friends with Darwin. He corresponded with him and then traveled to England and met him. Asa Gray was terrifically significant in bringing Darwin's works to America. So when Darwin had published The Origin of Species, it's Gray who gets him a publisher in the States who arranges for all those books to be published and promotes Darwinism. Now, Gray's interesting because he never quite gave up the idea of a divine creation, but he's also interesting to, for us because he shows how some people could compromise, and he, Gray kept an idea of a divine force, and he thoroughly believed in evolution and promoted Darwinism. Mm -hmm. So that's Asa Gray. We'll want to talk about Alfred Russell Wallace in a moment, I hope. Yeah. He's a very important figure in this story. Yeah. And the, the, other Harvard. Uh, the other Harvard professor was anti-Darwin, so it makes for a nice little case over mm. in the United States. There's one pro and there's one anti. So it's a very famous Louis Agassiz, who was a geologist by training, but then also a paleontologist and a comparative anatomist, mm. who built a big museum in um, Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and was very much a believer that God had created organisms exactly as he meant them to be, in exactly the places where he meant them to live, mm. and that any disruption of that would destroy the species. Yeah. And he and Gray argued a lot about Darwin. Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's interesting. So there's a herbarium named after Gray, I think. There is right? a herbarium named after Gray. Yeah, yes. yeah so it's still... The Gray Herbarium. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, yep, so we've gone through the, the others. Now, here's a, just a very easy quiz, or hopefully it's easy. What year was The Origin of Species first published? We'll see who's uh, read the MOOC or not. They've gone through the MOOC. So, 1856, 1859, 1861, or 1872. So go to the poll and make your, take your pick. And I'll click to the next slide and I'll actually give, give the answer away. So I'll give you a second to catch up with that. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Everybody. Right. Good. <laughs> Everybody's done well there. Yeah. Yeah, Sophie. Oops. Click on that there and show go. that the yeah down at the bottom it says 1859. So, just uh, four or five years ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary, and there were celebrations here in Darwin and you know, the rest of the world. I guess the the question so the the voyage was in the in the 1830s, and uh, I remember reading one part of the, of the about the voyage. I think it's the the governor and the Galapagos talked to him about the tortoises and he said, oh, I can tell what island a tortoise comes from just by looking at it because they're each different. I mean, really that's sort of almost handing him the idea on a platter. I mean, that's, that's really the, the crux of it, of, of, of a, you know, a big part of the idea of uh, at least evolution, if, if not by natural selection. But so, so that was in the 30s and it took 1859. What, why did, why did it take so long? Why, what was he do? Well, we know what he was doing, but was he worried about publishing it, or well, just didn't get around? You know, it's one of those unanswered questions in the history of science. What was? Why didn't Darwin publish straight away? Hmm. Lots of theories, lots of accounts of why. Some some people quite rightly say, well, the time wasn't right during um, the 1830s and 40s when Darwin first came up with this idea was perhaps the most revolutionary political time, social unrest mm. 
in Europe that there ever was in the 19th century. So that could have been that Darwin's ideas, if he was going to produce them suggesting that human beings emerge in a completely naturalistic way from the animal world, that's revolutionary and it would up, up, undermine all the hierarchies that were at, um, at that point being um, threatened by other so from other sources. So the idea might be that perhaps it wasn't the right time, that Darwin kept the theory back until he re believed the world in which he lived was much more stable. So that's probably part of the story. Yeah. There's a much more well-documented side of it that suggests that Darwin wasn't frightened, but that he really wanted to get it right. right. That he wanted to get make it as as positive as he could, to make the case really positive, and that he got examples from all kinds of um, branches of natural history that he wouldn't necessarily have thought of right at the beginning. So he had practical examples from his own personal experiments in his backyard. He had documentary evidence from all over the world that he'd been collecting. Um, he had thought about it for a long time. Uh, and I, we don't really want to get into this in too much detail, but that first theory in his notebooks was a first theory. Mm. And after 20 years of thinking about it, he had made that quite sophisticated and added depth and shifted a little some of the yeah. emphases. And he had done the barnacle work in between, and he really understood how evolution might work in practice yeah. through that long study. Yeah. Okay, so um, it took a long time for those ideas to, to, yes. to, to, to sort of gel. But, uh, so you don't really think that he was avoiding it? I mean, well, <coughs> yes, he might. He, he might, might have been, been yeah. avoiding it a bit. Yeah. Like he had a really good idea that he knew was going to cause an enormous amount of controversy. Yeah. So maybe he did procrastinate. Yeah. Maybe he did find more things to add. Yeah. Maybe he did say, oh, I think I'll do another eight years yeah. on butterflies. Yeah. Well, actually, he originally planned, I mean, the origin of species is a substantial volume, but he actually planned he sort of considered that the abstract of what he would really like to write about it. Yeah. He had begun writing an immensely long, learned, footnoted, fully academic text, and he was only maybe three quarters of the way through of that when he received the letter from Alfred Russell Wallace that I think we're going to talk about in a moment, okay. which interrupted that book, and then he changed plan and wrote a shorter book, what he thought was a shorter book, right. with no footnotes and it's a much more um, easy read, and that was The Origin of Species. Yeah, okay. yeah well let's move on to the next slide. Obviously we sort of uh, mentioned when we were talking about the others that were important, mm -hmm. we mentioned Wallace, but <clears throat> so Wallace had a very similar idea, and I think while he was suffering from malaria, it sort of came to him in, in, during a fever or something. Uh, and we'll talk about him much more, much more detail in week three. But then he he wrote to Darwin, who was well established at that point as sort of being the most eminent naturalist of the time, and he wrote to him a letter. How how important was that letter in pushing Darwin on? You think? To oh, that was a crucial letter. Darwin probably would have published his long manuscript without that letter from Wallace, but it stimulated, well, it was a shocking letter for Darwin. He wasn't at all sure, uh, he, I'm sorry, he, he had been um, completely obl oblivious to Wallace's interest in this right. subject. Yeah. Uh, so it was a shock, it was a surprise. Um, he felt very possessive about his own theory, but right. he also felt that science was an honourable profession and that Wallace had written a publishable essay long before he had done anything. Mm. So that the letter from Wallace really 
changed Darwin's life in the same way as the invitation to go on the Beagle Voyage mm. changed Darwin's life. Yeah. It was a, a different kind of process came into play yeah. after he received Wallace's letter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, did I so I guess uh, sort of related to that, uh, they, they worked independently. Yes. Um, then they came together to publish to publish a, uh, uh, a joint paper, is that right? Yeah. Yes and no. Right. That Wallace um, had asked Darwin, who he knew vaguely, but not terribly well, Wallace had asked Darwin to send his essay on to somebody else if it was good enough, which Darwin did. The someone else was Charles Lyell, who was Darwin's great friend. And so the outcome of that was a joint paper, but we, the word joint is a bit difficult here because neither man wrote it jointly. Right. It yeah. was two separate contributions that were published together. Right. And Wallace didn't even know it was happening. Oh, okay. Right. He, he was miles away. He was in the Malay archipelago. Yeah. And it took four months for a letter to get to him to say, we've published you yeah. with Mr. Darwin. Wallace didn't even know that Mr. Darwin had the same kind of idea. So it's yeah. a big shock for Wallace. Yeah. That, uh, there's a time delay here. Big shock for Darwin in yeah. the middle of the summer when he got Wallace's letter. Big shock for Wallace four months later when he gets Darwin's letter. Yeah, yeah. So Wallace was obviously, um, as I said, we'll talk more about him later, but he was a very accomplished naturalist in his own right, a great collector and, and thinker. And he has a lot of supporters, and rightly so, but some people have gone so far as to almost accuse Darwin of stealing ideas from, from Wallace. Would you like to comment on that? I myself don't think that could have been possible because the chronology doesn't work. Yeah. However, if you believe that Darwin received Wallace's letter and then didn't tell anybody about it, you could imagine that the only possible reason for doing that would be to steal something off of it. Yeah. But I think that could not have happened, or well, I know it could not have happened. And the particular ideas which Darwin might have taken from Wallace, we know were in Darwin's own materials years beforehand. Yeah. So there's no stealing. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end. I just thought one, one question um, that just occurred to me was, we've been talking about how long all of these ideas to, 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 to develop, but. I mean, we have Charles Darwin University now, but it took 150 years before there was a university named after, you know, a great scientist. And um, I mean, for example, if you think about Harvard. Well, Harvard. Who's John Harvard? I mean, nobody knows who John Harvard is yet. He has the most famous university in the world named after him, or one of the most famous universities in the world named after him. Um, why did it take so long? Do you think for anyone to think of naming a a, you know, learned institution after him. Do you know, I have no idea. I think it's marvellous that there is an institution named after him. There's a college in Cambridge named after Darwin, but that's mm. not a university, mm. that's just a residential college. Yeah. There's lots of things named after Darwin, including the city of Darwin, yeah. but no university until CDU. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, well, uh, we'll just wrap up here. Uh, just we have one sort of a related comment. This is just showing the, that his legacy lives on in, in many ways, not only in as in biology, uh, but it's very um, in popular culture as, as well. He's become a big hero in in the United Kingdom, as you can see from the fact that he's been put on the ten pound note. There are other people on other notes. But Darwin's been on the tenner, on the ten pounds, for a long time now. He's coming off next year, so if you want a souvenir, <laughs> now's your time to get it. That's worth about 20 US, US, um, Australian dollars, I would say. But if you look, that's the old Darwin with the beard on the right, and then on the left there's kind of symbolic representations of his voyage, his work. Right. 
Okay. All right. Uh, questions. You want to take that? Last? Shall we take that last one? Okay. Yeah. Oh, if you'd like to take. Yeah, right. There's one question that's come through that uh, is more about the long-term responses to Darwin and Darwinism, which will probably come up in later sessions as well. What kind of influence did the origin of species have on Marx, Karl Marx, and Engels, the founders of uh, communism, socialism? So we know that Marx was very interested in Darwin's book. He read it, and uh, um, after um, some thought about it, there's a little correspondence between Marx and Engels, and actually a couple of others in the movement. And Marx said, isn't it interesting how Darwin applies to animals and plants, or words to this effect, the social structure of Great Britain? So Marx was seeing in the origin of species in competition, as he would say, industrial competition, and selection and survival. Now, he's not approving of that, because his political system is quite different to communism. But he was seeing the origin of species as an expression of 19th century industrialized um, competitive uh, pro productivity. Right. So it wasn't, it wasn't like he was inspired by it or anything. No, it was more no, or less no. just saying. No. Oh, he, had, he definitely responded to it. Right. OK. Oh, that's interesting. OK. Um, Let's see, I can't really comment on it. I haven't seen the movie that was uh, asked about. Oh, is that the movie Creation? Yeah. Yeah, I... I don't see that one. Uh, up at the second one. Oh, yes. Those of you who have seen the movie that came out, oh, 2009, I guess it was, called Creation, which had Paul Bettany starring as Darwin, may have found the dramatizations very good but some of the actual content a little different from what we've been presenting in the MOOC. The accuracy of some of that movie is a bit doubtful to, towards the end in particular. And if we've got time to discuss it, the storyline of any kind of uh, um, cultural product needs to be dramatic so that Darwin's life was dramatized for the film by giving a central role to the death of his daughter, Annie. And then Darwin is shown, of course, grieving, but also hallucinating the daughter in uh, the years when he was writing The Origin of Species. And the daughter comes back to say to Darwin things like, well, Daddy, it's all about selection, and, and things like that, which, of course, we have no idea whether he hallucinated his daughter. It's a dramatic invention in order to make a storyline. So I found some of that myself a bit too much, a bit over the top, because I think his life is interesting enough without mm. the drama. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. We're going to leave you here with a quote from Darwin himself, and I think this really sort of uh, sums up some of his... I guess exuberance about the whole discovery idea of discovery and, and thinking about nature. Yes. This is a wonderful quote. Do do read it. Darwin was actually a wonderful writer. Okay, and thank you very much. And we'll be back uh, next week. Uh, Professor Brown will uh, be joining me next week. We'll be looking at the development of the idea of evolution and, and just a little bit about sort of a, the basics of how it works. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.